starting your career, probably this is top of mind for a lot of you right now. Um, I just wrote down a few things that I thought, you know, just to get your sort of mind thinking about the kinds of things that you can be doing. And so obviously there's certain things that you can do, you know, with the CHP program specifically, if you stop here and never take another class or a program again, um, I think these are all, you know, great opportunities that you should be able to take advantage of. So herbal education, you know, you can do talks, workshops, classes in areas of interest for you, either in person or now in the world that we're generally living in online. Um, the upside of being online is that you can be talking to people around the world. You're not just uh, restricted to your own geographical locations anymore. Uh, but there's a lot of interest in, in doing talks and workshops. And, you know, the more popular that you get or the more specialized your skill level or your interest in certain things, um, you know, more and more people will be interested in having you. And I know some herbalists that travel around the world just doing talks. Uh, you know, Robert Rogers, who does the mushroom program, uh, the mushroom course in our program. Uh, you know, he travels around the world uh, talking about medicinal mushrooms and getting to meet people and do mushroom walks in all different parts. Uh, there's people that do flower essences and they travel around the world as well. So um, herbal education can take you lots of places uh, and introduce you to a lot of people uh, and, you know, provide a, a lot of enjoyment, I think. Um, herbal medicine making, this is another thing that I think is a, a really great opportunity for people. So, you know, maybe starting your own local herbal dispensary, working at farmer's market, selling online. I mean, it's crazy to me, you know, even since I graduated in 2001, the world that we now live in, um, you know, when I applied to school back in the late 90s, I had to handwrite everything and I, I mailed it in an envelope. And, uh, you know, now here we are, email is the norm, online delivery, you know, people are buying things online. You no longer are restricted to your own geographical area. So, you know, medicine making can be, you know, a huge opportunity regardless of where you live now. You know, if you're in a small town, it doesn't really matter. The world becomes your, your marketplace. So uh, herbal medicine making is great. Um, herb walks, so leading walks in your own local area, kind of ties into herbal education, but um, it's a specific niche, I think, that a lot of people are interested in. And, and I think, to be honest, it doesn't really matter where you live. You know, I was thinking about this yesterday. Uh, you know, the college itself is located downtown Victoria. It's not a big city, but it is still a city. Uh, and we have um, ghost walks that go on. And I thought, you know, why not approach like a company like that that's already doing uh, walks and talks in your local city and do something that's uh, talking about the wild weeds of the city. Uh, you know, like everyone's stepping over the dandelion and the burdock and the chickweed and the plantain and, you know, this whole um, grouping of medicinal plants that everyone is walking around on a daily basis that you is probably more nutritious than the salads that you're buying at the grocery store and providing you access to medicines that are right there. So, um, you know, I think there's some great opportunities to, to network and collaborate with businesses that are already in your area. Um, herb writing, so creating articles, content for blogs, websites, print media, you know, there's no shortage of people that are looking for information on plant-based medicine, and you can be that individual to help uh, create that content. Um, herb gardening, uh, another good one, so designing, building, maintaining herb gardens for yourself or others. Uh, and again, you know, one of the things that I thought about years ago that just never had time to actually um, get into, because we ended up starting this college instead, which took a lot of time. Um, but approaching like landscape companies. Uh, I know there's a few here now that specialize in like edible landscapes uh, where they're sort of helping you make your vegetable gardens. Um, but you could do medicinal landscaping, you know, and as a you know community herbalist, I think it would be within your realm to, uh, you know, work with this company. You could sort of say that you would like to go uh, to specific individuals, to their house, you know, maybe talk with the people who live there and say, you know, what are your general health concerns? They might say, you know, I'm, I have a lot of stress or difficulty sleeping, whatever it happens to be. And if it seems like it's something that's fairly uh, easy to work with, you may recommend certain plants that they grow. You know, you should grow some passionflower and skullcap and California poppy and chamomile. Uh, and you can work with that company to help sort of design a medicinal herb garden that's specifically relevant to their unique health needs. Uh, and then you can come back later. And again, you're being paid for this to come back, help them learn how to gather that medicine uh, and then tie back into medicine making. And, you know, here's how you make a salve and we can make a tincture for this. Uh, and you're sort of helping enlighten people about the use of plants in their own backyard 
and sort of creating this whole industry for yourself, which I think would be great. Um, Purple consultant, so you know, working in a local dispensary, health food shop, providing advice, recommendations on herbal medicine. Um, again, you know, there's no shortage of people that are feeling overwhelmed with their choices of natural health, um, either feeling unheard or invalidated sometimes from the healthcare community. Uh, we find that a lot in our herbal clinics at the college that, you know, one of the main reasons why people come in is it's kind of their last um, hope. You know, sometimes their common phrase, they've talked to their family doctor, they've had tests done, they've gone to walk-in clinics and they're not just getting any answer. You know, the, the tests come back negative, but no one's recognizing that their felt experience is problematic and they're having these symptoms. Um, and so, you know, being able to provide sound, knowledgeable advice to people about what supplements are working, what herbs might be useful, um, I think that would be really great. But also acting as somewhat of like a health navigator. And so, you know, you might access a lot of other healthcare services in your local community. Maybe you, you know, you see a chiropractor or, you know, an acupuncturist. And I think sometimes we just take for granted that everybody knows what these things are and what they do. And it's just not true. And so, you know, someone coming in describing, uh, you know, stress or digestive disturbances for you and you're recommending, you know, chamomile tea or meadowsweet or whatever it happens to be, you can say, you know, there's also a really great acupuncturist in town. And they might say, well, I thought acupuncture was just for pain. It was just putting needles in someone. You're like, no, it works for digestive health. You can work with stress and sleep. And so you can help sort of point them in the direction of other practitioners that would also be uh, really worth their while. Uh, herbal wildcrafting. So this is gathering local medicinal plants to be sold to restaurants and herb shops. So I think this is more up and coming. Um, there's a lot of potential in this. I know some mushroom uh, wild crafters making, you know, a very good living by uh, finding local mushrooms and being able to sell those into um, the, the local culinary industry. Uh, and you can do the same thing for medicinal plants. And whether that's like edible plant flowers, so your nasturtiums and your marigolds and things like that, uh, or, you know, other types of culinary herbs that they're going to be um, cooking with. And then other unique ideas. So I mean, anything that can have kind of a herbal medicine theme to it, uh, you can still sort of uh, work on and, and sort of combine passions and interests. So like I mentioned before, traveling, uh, a lot of traveling opportunity in the education uh, side of things. Um, but there's certain people, you know, who travel for food. You know, they, they, they go to a travel agency and they want to find out, you know, I want to go to France and I want to find these great restaurants and experience these kinds of things, you know, help me organize my trip. And so there's a number of people that are interested in plant medicines and, um, you know, organic farms and permaculture farms and things like that. And a lot of them are welcoming uh, the general public to come and see the, the process by which herbs are uh, made into medicines. And so maybe you start to generate a list of places around the world where you can, you know, live on a farm or, you know, do some woofing opportunities or you're aware of uh, herbal manufacturers that are open to uh, tours. And you start to put together, you know, packages or itineraries for people. Uh, so something like that. Herb games, um, you know, kids games would be great as a way to try to uh, engage people at a younger uh, age level uh, to be mindful of the natural world and their health and uh, sustainability issues. And so there's a huge possibility for that, whether it's a physical game that you sell or something online. Um, organizing conferences. So there's no shortage of people, especially now online, that are looking for uh, educational opportunities. So, you know, pulling together uh, groups of people, and it may not all be herbal medicine, but maybe you choose a topic like um, insomnia or uh, menopause or um, dealing with stress, and you put together a speakers panel, you know, a herbalist, a naturopath, uh, a nutritionist, a counselor, uh, and you sort of have these conferences that talk about very specific um, health concerns. Uh, things like herb photography, you know, people are always looking for content for their website or print material or things like that. And so, uh, you know, maybe that's something that sparks your interest as well. So a lot of opportunities, I think, is kind of what I hoped to leave uh, you with in, in this sense. Um, and then, you know, moving on from there, there are other opportunities to sort of grow from here. And so I mentioned, you know, the CHP program, our goal with that was to, to give you as much knowledge as possible uh, to, uh, you know, grow your own medicines, uh, harvest them, 
make medicines with them, um, learn some general ideas about how the body can go wrong, the disease processes, and trying to figure out ways to um, engage with somebody in the sense of using uh, herbal medicine to help um, more for yourself and family and friends and things like that, or in like a local health food store. If you're thinking like, I want to have, like I'm really enjoying this and I wanna do more and I would like to be able to help people more in their time of need with these very uh, complex and problematic health conditions, then you're looking more for like a clinical practitioner type of program. Uh, and there are programs like that that exist around the world. Obviously, PRC has one of them as well. Um, but depending on where you live, you know, uh, look locally to try and find something. They're generally three to four years long, uh, diploma to degree, uh, and they should contain clinical hours of training. And so most of those herbal associations that I mentioned, the AHG, the National Institute, the Canadian Herbal Association, they're looking for a minimum of 500 clinical hours of training to show that you've gathered as much information as you can to be um, knowledgeable and safe when it comes to working with the general public. And so that's a possibility for you uh, to do is to, to look into something like that. Um, the clinical training hours generally should be broken up into like a graduated system where you're, you know, watching herbalists do clinic first. So you get a sense of what this looks like and, how, you know, what kinds of questions people are asking and why, why that information is relevant. Uh, and then it should sort of be like culminating in you actually leading the consultation and working with patients on your own uh, with a mentor, sort of overseeing you, someone that can provide, provide feedback and guidance and to support you through that uh, training process. Um, so I think, you know, that's a, a really great opportunity. If, if any of you are considering that, you know, so far what you've been learning resonates with you, you feel passionate about it. Uh, I know for me, when I first started studying herbal medicine, um, it was the greatest thing ever. And, uh, you know, having this ability to look after yourself and utilize the things that grew around me to um, help other people and make a, a positive impact in their life, uh, I can't really imagine something better, uh, to be honest. So, uh, you know, if that's the kind of thing that calls to you as well, and you're feeling this strong passion, then uh, clinical training programs, I think, would probably be something that would be really worth your while after the end of this program. Um, there's other postgraduate training as well. So you can do a Bachelor of Science in uh, in herbal medicine. Uh, I think the UK is the only place. There might be one in New Zealand and Australia. Um, but there are now masters of science programs in both kind of like herbal medicine and integrative medicine. Um, so there's one that I did some training at in the UK, the University of Central Lancashire. Uh, most of them are online because they recognize that there's not uh, usually like a geographical conglomeration of herbalists that are all looking to do uh, postgraduate work. So it really lends itself more to like the sort of global market. So it's great in the sense that you get to be doing a course with someone sitting in New Zealand and Australia and Canada and the UK and Africa and wherever uh, to sort of hear like different vantage points, the types of plants that they're using, um, their understanding of medicine, their the variations in the energetic properties. And so, you know, going through some of those are really great opportunities. And they're more if you're looking to do like research. So you know, one of the things that people sort of argue about herbal medicine sometimes is they're like, but, you know, where's the research or where's the clinical evidence? You know, you can say that this, um, you know, plant has been used for thousands of years. And, you know, I do this other presentation where I talk about chamomile and um, chamomile being found in the molars of preserved Neanderthals from 50,000 years ago. Uh, and the recognition that, uh, you know, chamomile doesn't have a nutritional value to it. So these individuals weren't consuming chamomile as a food, but the only reason it would have been in their teeth then would have been for some sort of medicinal property. Uh, and so, you know, here's kind of like early evidence of a 50,000 year at least use of chamomile, the same chamomile we use today uh, as a medicinal product. So, Yes, I think we would all argue that there's not really a shortage of historical evidence of plants being used. And you could make the argument um, that, you know, humans over time would have abandoned something if there was absolutely no benefit or use from it. So the fact that it's still being used obviously gives some indication that there is um, some value to it. But it's not the kind of value that the scientific model looks at. And so if you're thinking about maybe doing like clinical research, clinical trials, 
um, trying to sort of marry these two worlds together, the tradition and the folklore and the modern kind of approach, uh, then a master's degree in herbal medicine or integrative medicine might be the kind of thing for you uh, where you're able to sort of put that research hat on and, and really move the industry forward and uh, integrate better with uh, modern healthcare practitioners. Uh, or it could be that there's a complementary field that uh, you're now interested in. So this is sort of like you're opening to the world of plants and medicine and healing and healthcare. Um, and you're not quite sure that you want to be a clinical practitioner necessarily, but you definitely want to do more. There's a curiosity there. And so studies like ethnobotany, which is the study of how cultures around the world uh, integrate with plants. And that's like, you know, plants for building, plants for medicine, plants for cooking, plants for um, textiles and fabrics. Um, so that might be something that interests you. Uh, botany in general, you know, maybe you find that you have a passion for plants. You love studying them and, uh, you know, maybe you get into like horticulture and, and growing plants. Uh, or maybe it's the pharmacology. You know, maybe you're fascinated by the fact that these plants make these certain kinds of chemical constituents that are useful for the human body. Uh, you know, why is that? Why do these plants do this? And, and how do we isolate them? And how do we figure this out? And, uh, you know, this is a, a huge field that you can get into to try to, you know, explore the wonderful opportunities that plants provide for uh, medicine for a lot of people. Um, so I think, you know, ultimately it's, it's best to just be flexible in what you decide to do, um, knowing that there's no one, you know, real path to being a herbalist. And I try to say this to like, all of my students that are coming through the program, which is why we have, you know, so many instructors. You look at the program that you're taking right now, uh, you know, it's not one person teaching you all the classes and it's not, you know, one individual doing all of these webinars with you. We recognize that herbal medicine is this living, breathing, uh, diverse um, system of medicine that stems back millennia through human history. Uh, and there's no one way to do it. And so we want to try to provide you with as many opportunities to see how various people talk about plants, how they work with plants, how they use them. Uh, and so your path from here will change. Maybe you start thinking you want to do clinical practice, but no, you realize it's more research. Maybe you start thinking you want to make medicines, but no, it's actually, I want to farm and I want to grow. And so uh, try not to be too rigid with your thought process and sort of have some flexibility and let the plants guide you. Uh, Paul Bergner, who's a herbalist in the U.S., talks about this um, sort of triangle of teaching, medicine making and consulting um, as a really great way to try to build your business. So he says, you know, you should you should do teaching, do workshops, do online classes. And the people that come to take those classes with you will meet you and get to interact with you. And then they learn that you actually make medicines and, you know, they can buy some teas from you or capsules or tinctures. Or they also hear that you're doing, you know, some sort of clinical practice or that you, uh, you know, do some, um, you know, educational component about uh, herbal medicine. And maybe they, they, they come uh, to see you for a, a consultation uh, or maybe you're selling herbs at a farmer's market and you meet somebody and you say, oh, actually, I, I teach a class on Thursdays if you want to join. And so now this customer of yours becomes your student. And so uh, if you kind of look at each of those three areas you get the sense that they all sort of relate to one another. Um, and it provides, the thing that I like about herbal medicine, it provides this flexibility in your day. You know, a lot of careers, it's the same thing day in, day out. Uh, herbal medicine allows you to have this flexibility. Sometimes you're making medicine, sometimes you're teaching, sometimes you're working with an individual. Um, and so each day is different. And even when you're working with individuals, they're different. Their health needs are different. Even if two people come in with high blood pressure, you know, the reasons they have high blood pressure are different. Uh, the herbs that you might recommend might be different. So there's a lot of variation that I think, you know, helps to keep things fresh and new and exciting. Um, I would say choose things that you enjoy and are passionate about. I think that's always one of the biggest things that stifles people is, uh, you know, if they don't enjoy it or they're not really happy about what they're doing, then you're less likely to want to do it. And so I would try to, to find those things that really bring you joy. Um, look for a no local niche. So if there's, you know, something in your local area that uh, you think isn't being done or, you know, you saw something somewhere else that was working really well and it's not happening where you are, um, then maybe introduce it there so that uh, it's something that the general public might be really interested in. 
and kind of like I was saying with other businesses, like the you know the ghost walks or um, landscape companies, um, but like reach out to local businesses and try to collaborate with them. Say, you know, I'm a herbalist and I have this sort of background in herbal medicine. And I really feel like there's a unique opportunity here for me to, you know, do a walk on this or to help your current clients integrate this into their design. Um, so rather than starting from scratch and saying, you know, how am I going to build up this business? It sounds like a lot of work. You know, look to see what's available already in your local area and and work with them. Um, because the one thing I can say right now is that businesses are looking for ways to um be competitive, to provide value to what they're doing, um, to network and uh, to work with others. So I think now is a great opportunity to, to reach out to some of these uh, other businesses that exist. And then just be ready to build it in a steady and sustainable way. Um, you know, and, and consider your lifestyle choices. If you like traveling, then maybe choose something that's naturally aligned with moving around. You know, it's kind of hard sometimes to have a clinical practice where you're looking after patients in a very specific area if every two weeks you like to be gone uh, because there's people that are going to be looking for that continuity of care. They're, they need to see you in two weeks' time, and you can't just say, well, I'm in the rainforest now for the next three months. Uh, you know, I'll see you when I get back. So, um, you know, try to think about what lifestyle choices you want and how you want your life to kind of be unfolding and try to choose aspects of the herbal medicine career that sort of is in line with that as much as possible. Um, the only thing I would just sort of like try to, to emphasize again is that if you're looking to do that clinical work that, um, you know, going through and doing more clinical training would be uh, necessary. Um, and then sort of the last part is talking about the, the future of herbal medicine. So we'll kind of finish up here and then um, open up the, the chat box there and see what kinds of questions you might have or anything else that you want me to be talking about. Um, so the future, I think, is integration and collaboration. Um, and there's an example. So I worked, I, I, I don't know if I mentioned this at the beginning, but I, I lived in South Korea for two years and I taught um, herbal medicines there and I learned about Chinese herbal medicine. Um, and one of the things that I found fascinating was the way that their healthcare system works and the fact that they integrate, you know, sort of Chinese medicine and acupuncture and Chinese herbs along with, you know, what we think of as like as Western medicine or pharmaceutical medicine, operations, surgeries, uh, pharmaceuticals. Um, you know, the word drug itself comes from herbal medicine. It, it literally means dried plant. And so uh, it, this sort of like stems back to this idea that modern Western medicine has sort of been born out of these natural principles that we still uh, abide by and function within. Um, but the future, I think, is collaboration between those. And so, um, you know, 20, 30 years ago, still in, in places like China, you would go to a hospital and even as you were getting something like open heart surgery, uh, the surgeons would be doing the open heart surgery. There would be acupuncturists who would be putting lots of needles in for pain management and, you know, tissue health uh, while you were hooked up to an IV drip of a herbal decoction. Um, you know, this is... This is not crazy. This is not something that's, you know, out of the realm of possibility. It doesn't happen here. Those two worlds don't um, combine at this point, uh, but there's no reason why they can't. In other parts of the world, they do, and I feel like they should here. Uh, you know, one of the things that we keep hearing about the, the medical system in Canada, at the very least, but other parts of the world, is how overworked it is and how people don't have access to family doctors and the continuity of care, which... I think is even more crucial today than it has been in the past because a lot of our uh, patients are experiencing chronic, long-term, complex health conditions. So they actually need more interactions with doctors. They need, um, you know, someone who's sort of with them as a uh, as a, a guide through this process, not someone that, you know, anytime that they have a symptom flare-up, they just bounce between practitioners and nobody has ever seen them before and they don't know the past history. They just put on another medication uh, and there's no real good follow-up. So um, I think, you know, that's why our mindset has always been to teach at the highest level possible uh, because I, I still feel strongly that there is this requirement to, to really integrate as much as possible with the, the healthcare model that we have here and that herbal medicine has a very uh, important role to play. Um, 
And so I think, you know, that's a really important uh, piece uh, because I think we need to be able to work with other practitioners and, and kind of like what I was saying about being a, a health navigator. I think, you know, one of the roles of being a herbalist is to try to help people understand um, what options they have for health and healing and making sure that they are informed about um, all of their choices. You know, all too often now, it seems like people think of medicine and their natural inclination is, uh, you know, medical doctor, drugs, medications, and or surgery. Uh, and we need to go back to a point in time where we recognize that there's other forms of intervention and that herbal medicine uh, plays a really important role. There used to be an old adage that said, first the word, then the herb, then the knife. Uh, and that was sort of like one of the, the sort of mantras that people would use, you know, counseling first, talking to people, educating them, giving them advice, giving recommendations. That would be the first step towards modifying their health. Then the herb or, you know, changing their diet, integrating things. And last, the last opportunity is surgical intervention or some sort of like extreme intervention. Uh, and all too often, it feels like it's been reversed. I mean, the first option is usually completely removed uh, and you move straight into some form of like, uh, like I said, pharmaceutical or surgical intervention. Um, the other thing that we always need to keep in mind as herbalists is that we are the stewards of the plants as well and the land. And so, uh, I mean, we already hear horrifying news about, uh, you know, climate change and the impacts of um, you know, humanity on the world when it comes to, you know, animal life, insect life, plant life, biodiversity. Uh, and, you know, here we are advocating for the further use of plants. And so, you know, if we want more and more people to sort of work with us and be more um, accessing of herbal medicine and plant-based medicine, we need to make sure that part of our job is, is this, is this sustainable? You know, what practices do we need to put in place to make sure that echinacea still exists and marigold still exists and that we're not, you know, further damaging this world that we live in uh, by advocating for more and more people using plant-based medicine. So, you know, permaculture practices, biodynamic farming, uh, ethical wild harvesting practices, um, eating and growing locally. Uh, so, you know, bioregionally versus, you know, shipping plants all around the world. You know, these are all things that, you know, need to be the top of our mind as herbalists as well, because it's it's definitely part of our, um, it's, it's our modality. It's, it's part of what we do and how we interact. And then lastly, you know, just looking at, you know, kind of what I alluded to before, the, the change in the, the nature of disease and sickness for people. And, uh, you know, they tend to be more complex. Western medicine is amazing for acute care uh, and emergency care. You know, if you have a heart attack, you get hit by a car, you have some sort of traumatic injury, you absolutely want to access the hospital and doctors and surgeons and medications. Um, no one's saying that, you know, herbal medicine replaces any of those. Um, but, you know, maintaining health, um, preventing uh, disease processes from starting, managing um, side effects of medications, and even, um, you know, integrating to try to manage these complex chronic health conditions in the first place. You know, Peter always talks about complex health conditions needing complex medicine. You know, the thing about pharmaceuticals is that they're individual constituents. You know, so one drug, one medicine is usually one individual chemical, and that's it. And, you know, our bodies up until the last 50 years have never really been engaged with single individual chemical constituents. It's not a it's not a normal way for our body to kind of be um, engaging with the outside world. It's used to complexity. You know, you, you would eat foods and there would be thousands and thousands of chemicals entering into your bloodstream via your digestive tract and integrating with your immune system and your hormonal system and your nervous system. And so it just sort of it responds better. It uh, It's just a more common approach. And so uh, the complexity of the medicine that we offer in herbal medicine ties in nicely with the complexity of the healthcare um, issues that we're seeing more and more uh, commonly now with, with people accessing um, modern medicine. And so I think ultimately there's a lot of opportunity for herbalists. Um, we offer a lot. We have the ability to uh, help a great number of people overcome their health concerns and uh, live better, healthier lives. And, uh, you know, the knowledge that you're getting in this program, I think, is 
going to provide you with such a strong foundation to be that positive change in your local community. Um, if nothing other than telling people again that, you know, there are other options and opportunities for, um, you know, managing their health concerns. And so, you know, I wish you all the very best with your, uh, you know, continuing studies with us and your future careers within herbal medicine. Um, and like I said, if there's anything that I can ever do to help support you in any way, then I'm, I'm definitely here for that. So thanks for your time. It looks like we're right on an hour right here. So I'm going to open up the chat function and uh, see if I can scroll down and see if I can see some questions that you guys have. So um, Sabina has a question. What about the ability of the client to give consent? In other words, do they or should they sign a statement that they understand and agree to the treatment? Um, yes, good point. And so most times, so informed consent is absolutely crucial. Um, and so often I think that this doesn't happen. And, and so one of the things about informed consent is that you have to you have to provide all the options to somebody so that they can actually make a, a, an informed decision. And so, you know, even when you go see your family doctor or, uh, you know, any kind of healthcare provider, they are obligated to to tell you. So yes, you could do surgery. Yes, you can take this pharmaceutical. But you know what? Modifying your diet would would actually be as good as doing this. Uh, otherwise, it's not really an informed consent. And so as a, as a practitioner, as a clinical practitioner, and if you join a herbal association, or if we ever become a regulated profession, it's mandated that you would have a consent form. And even at the college, if you come and see us for a clinical assessment, you sign a document that basically says that you are, you know, of your own free mind coming into the college, that you're looking for advice and recommendations about the use of herbal medicines. Uh, there's an inherent risk. Uh, some people have allergic reactions that we may not be able to anticipate. That's not common, um, but we have to sort of mention, you know, what the potentials are, and then people have to sign. And so, uh, yeah, I think if you are, you know, working with an individual that you should absolutely um, have some sort of documentation that they sort of sign off on agreeing that they're consenting to your treatment. And the other thing I would say, I, I tell students as well, that that's, it's an ongoing thing. So if you see someone in January for insomnia, let's just say, and they give consent and they say, yes, you know, I, I want to, um, I want to work with you with herbal medicine and you do the best. And it's sort of like this 80, 20 rule, 80% of the people will respond really well to herbs and just some won't. Um, just like some of you have probably gone to see a chiropractor or a massage therapist and you're like, yeah, it didn't, for me, it just didn't do what I was hoping it to do. And so, you know, you might try for a couple of months doing herbal teas and tinctures and you're substituting plants. You're like California poppy and Jamaican dogwood and they're just not getting any better with sleep. You still need to check in with them, you know, a month in or two months in and just say, okay, I've tried a lot. Um, I'm not necessarily giving up on you, but how do you feel? Do you feel like you still want to continue? Um, do you want to try another formula again? Or would you like some recommendations of other practitioners that might be useful for you to seek? Um, so informed consent is an ongoing thing. Don't just get a signature you know, in one year and sort of keep going from there. Uh, Lindsay says, if we have previous training in acupuncture massage therapy, would that be considered further education for the biomed component of clinical herbalism? Yeah, I would say if you, if you have... Um, you know, additional training already, if you're aware of anatomy and physiology and pathophysiology and, uh, you know, biochemistry and pharmacology, uh, those are the kinds of courses that you would be taking in a clinical herbal medicine program as well. And so most schools will offer transfer credits. And so if you're applying to go to a different school, you would show them the background that you had in acupuncture, massage, or, or whatever it happened to be. Uh, and they would make an assessment of the level of education that you'd received and then tell you what courses you would be exempt from having to take again. Uh, and that would count towards your um, training. So that's a possibility as well. Um, let me keep scrolling up. Are there more? I don't see any other questions. James, we have a question that came in from offline. Okay. Um, and the question is, if you already have a healthcare practitioner, if you, sorry, if you already are a healthcare practitioner in a regulated profession like acupuncture, are you allowed to incorporate herbal knowledge into your acupuncture practice? Um, I would say there would be no, 
there would be no ruling on our part, uh, sort of within the profession of herbal medicine, that that wouldn't be acceptable. But I know it it varies depending on the actual regulatory college that you're a member of. So so different um, regulatory colleges. So I may be wrong about this, but I have this general feeling like chiropractors aren't allowed to sell products. Um, they just feel, I think the association just kind of feels like it's a conflict, uh, that they don't want the practitioner to sort of be profiting off of some advice that they're giving to somebody else. And so uh, they're not able to. And so certain uh, professional practitioners are sort of barred or not allowed to engage in certain kinds of practices. And so the best person to check if you are in a regulated profession already would be to check with your regulatory college. Um, there's usually like bylaws or um, some sort of like constitution or information that talks about what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. And, you know, before you get into it and some, someone ends up, you know, filing a complaint against you and taking you off guard, I would, uh, I would check with them first and just say, you know, if I've, if I've got this additional training in Western herbal medicine, uh, am I allowed to integrate that in my practice? I would say uh, most likely it's going to be fine, but you just want to make sure that um, there's no, there's not nothing to impede you from doing that. Um, on just quickly on that note, the other thing I just wanted to mention, because I know this might come up uh, with some of you as well, with uh, with respect to working with animals, and so um, there is an an opportunity that's going on right now with the CHABC that we're trying to engage the provincial government uh, to change the rules around veterinary medicine. Uh, but as it stands in British Columbia, the only people who are allowed to work medicinally with um, animals are vets. And so it doesn't matter even if you are a registered acupuncturist, a registered massage therapist, a chiropractor, um, even in a regular profession, you can't work on animals right now. And so uh, if any of you that are studying this program that are interested in working with animals potentially at some point in time, just know again that that's currently not allowed, um, that we're hoping to sort of make some modifications to that, but that's a, that's a protected practice uh, exclusively reserved for veterinarians. Yeah. Sorry about that. I just, I just read Leah's question. Uh, how vastly different are the programs of study in the U.S. versus Canada? Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of wildly different programs. And so this sort of requires you, well, one, to be very clear about what it is that your end goals are. Are, are you just looking for general knowledge, general information, or are you wanting to be a clinical practitioner? Um, because there are certain programs in the U.S. that are degree level that do no clinic. Um, they're, they're kind of just theory based. So they talk about therapeutics, you do materia medicas, but there's no clinical training. And then so you would be required at that point to go and seek out other herbal practitioners to do clinical training with on your own. Um, other schools, they're kind of individually led. So it's it's one practitioner who's kind of started their own school and they teach everything. And and that might be great. It's, it's more of like an apprenticeship style where you really resonate with this person's uh, understanding of plants and how they um, how they work and how they make medicines and, you know, everything about what they do you love. And that would be great because now you're going to study with them and learn everything the way that they do. But if, if you're like me and you kind of want this like eclectic background and, you know, how does Amanda do this and how does Peter do that? And how does Robert get mushrooms? Um, then you're going to look for a school that has multiple faculty members, different backgrounds, uh, different sort of learning opportunities. Um, so I think that's pretty critical to, to think about. And then, you know, what what do you need the end qualification to be? And so, uh, you know, I mentioned that I went to South Korea and I, I ended up teaching English before I started teaching herbal medicine. But even to go to Korea to teach English, you have to have a degree. The degree can be in anything. Um, and so, you know, if you're looking to do like a, a master's program at some point, maybe when I was talking about ethnobotany, you're like, yeah, that's the thing that I want to do. Um, you need an undergrad degree first. So if you're looking for a herbal medicine program, it would be important for you to find a bachelor of science degree program in herbal medicine, not just a diploma. Otherwise, you're going to end up having to take another course just to meet that requirement to have a degree. So you might as well do them all wrapped up together. Um, so, yeah, just be cautious that there's clinical training available um, and that they have the courses that you're looking for and the diverse background of faculty uh, that you're looking for as well. So. Yeah, they're, they're definitely different. The other thing I would say is, you know, when I studied in England, um, in the UK, they were very, this was back in the late 90s, 
they were very motivated to try to integrate with the healthcare system. And so they cut a lot of the, um, the beautiful parts, I guess, of herbal medicine out of their program. So it was more scientific. So there was no like real tradition, no folklore, no energetics. Uh, we didn't talk about any of that because that was kind of frowned upon in the, you know, the scientific community. Uh, and it's still to this day, I, I mean, there, there used to be, I think maybe 10 Bachelor of Science programs in the UK over the last decade, and they're down to one uh, because there was this huge uh, public campaign to pressure universities to pull these programs uh, and their funding. So they, uh, they campaigned against the businesses that funded the universities uh, and ultimately said, this is the antithesis of science. You know, how can someone who studies herbal medicine be given a Bachelor of Science degree? It's it's anything but science. Um, and they would make arguments like, you know, what's this whole thing about hot and cold medicine? That's ridiculous. And you're like, well, have you ever had a chili pepper in your mouth? You know, let's talk about hot and cold. And so, um, you know, there there was a lot of pressure in the UK to to sort of conform to the medical model. And so their programs at universities obviously change to kind of facilitate that. So um, I think what you get with the smaller schools is they're more agile, more nimble. They can be more um, accommodating to their students. And then when you move into like more larger and larger institutions, like, you know, a large university where they have tens of thousands of students, you know, they're not really focused on the 30 people who may want to be studying herbal medicine and, uh, and sort of really catering it to your own unique needs. Um, so yeah, I would say, you know, smaller schools are great, larger, diverse sort of faculties, uh, making sure there's a clinical training program. And then what is the end goal that you're trying to achieve with it and making sure that it aligns with that. Oh, I think there's another question. Uh, are there any books that you can recommend that cover patient interview methods? Um, I don't have one here with me. Um, it's it comes up more i think with um like clinical training uh practices i'm trying to th i'm trying to think of her name i may have to email you at the end of it but there's a there's a book that talks about like clinical exam skills and the consultation oh actually there's um peter's book i'm going to plug peter for you he has a book called the um the consultation in phytotherapy and it's a, an amazing textbook that really goes through all of the ins and outs of patient communication and the dynamics of clinical care uh, and the various roles that a practitioner has to take, which I think is really important to understand that um, even, you know, I was talking about there's a lot of flexibility being a herbalist. You can make medicine, you can teach, and you can be a clinical practitioner. Even a clinical practitioner requires you to be dynamic. So, um you know, different patients require a different approach from you. Some people you need to engage with them and you need to be kind of like the teacher and they're the student. Others, you need to be almost like a, like a pastor or like a minister or it's like some sort of um, like spiritual kind of guide. Others, you have to be more of like a parental figure. Others are looking for more of like the mystical kind of energetic. And so um, it's not one size fits all. And I found this you know, in the opposite effect, I, one of my patients who came to see me once was a was a medical doctor. And I had just made this pre assumption that he wanted to talk to me in like the scientific model and, you know, Western medical terminology. And so we did, we did the whole consultation. And I was trying to sort of live up to this expectation of being very methodical and clinically minded. And we got to the end, and I told him, you know, my thoughts and my ideas about the treatment strategy. And he agreed. And he thought everything was great, but then he's like, I was kind of looking for like the folklore and the history and the tradition, you know, the thing that we don't have in our system of medicine. I was like, right, you know, just, just because he is a doctor doesn't mean that's what he's looking for in his consultation. Um, you know, he was looking for the magic of herbal medicine. That's why he came to a herbalist. You know, he, that, that's the thing that's missing that uh, really resonated with him. So, um, just be aware that in that clinical setting, um, there's a lot of flexibility. And Peter really does a great job, you know, talking about that. How do you change your your personality, your talking style, the language that you're using, um, you know, all of those things to make yourself a better clinical practitioner. So I'm pretty sure it's called the Consultation in Phytotherapy uh, by Peter Conway.
Just a note on that, Peter's course at the end of the community herbalism program called Therapeutic Relationships also covers a lot of that, working with people, different language, different um, different ways to just hold space. So keep an eye out for that. Mm -hmm. Anything else from anybody? Any last questions or concerns? Or I'm hoping you found this inspirational or motivational or at the very least informational. <laughs> Okay, well, James, that was fantastic. I think that sums everything up. Okay. We got all the questions answered. Um, yeah, that was wonderful. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk through herbal regulation and career ideas. And I think it was really inspirational for everyone. So I think we Great. have everyone saying thank you over here on the chat. Yeah. 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 Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it. And uh, if you need to get a hold of me, maybe just check in with Liza. She knows how to. Um, uh, to get in touch with me directly and and we can go from there well should i answer this one last question uh from alicia holman how does herbal ceremony fit into the discussion um i mean that's a course i think that more serafina was talking about um and I, yeah i i feel strongly that you can integrate ceremony and I think, to be perfectly honest, I feel like ceremony is missing a lot from our um, lives these days. And I talk about this sometimes with patients. There's no rites of passage. There's no celebration, you know, like coming of age or moving through transitions in your life um, that, that occur more in like indigenous practices and more traditional um, ways of thinking and behaving. And uh I agree. So part of like clinical practice for me and being a practitioner is is potentially working in ceremony. And so you kind of have to gauge the level of um, involvement and engagement with your patient potentially as well. Kind of like what I was saying. Some people will be like, no, uh, you know, I'm not doing this. Other people would love to hear, you know, the ceremony about making a tea. Like it, it could be as simple as putting herbs in a pot, pouring hot water on it and letting it steep for 10 minutes. It could be, you know, um, you know, putting the pot of tea on a specific stone or crystal or, you know, having something written down like the, the motivation or the goal that you're trying to achieve with that tea. You put that on it. You, you meditate on something. You think about it. Like you have kind of like some ceremony around even the preparation of the medicine. And so, um, yeah, I think ceremony can play a huge part in that. I would say that probably Serafina in your program would be an ideal person to have some of those conversations with. And as, uh, as far as I remember, like part of her training in this course talks about herbal ceremony as well. But uh, Peter's book also has um, some conversations and he'll probably talk about it like Liza said in the last class that you guys are having in this program as well with uh, uh, patient communication. So. Yeah, I would say herbal ceremony is important and ceremony in general, I think in people's lives are missing. Awesome, thank you everybody, it was great. I mean, it would be nice to, to see all of you I, uh, and where you're from and hear more about you, but uh, it was nice to be able to engage at least at this level. And uh, so I thank you for your time today. I appreciate it. And um, like I said, if you need to get in touch with me, you can and just good luck with your further studies.